Hi, Shani, Suzanne, where people have asked, so uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my lucky Shakespeare socks. I went to the British Library, and the last time, 10 years ago, I went, I got an hour long DVD of Beowulf and Anglo Saxon. I've got 20th century poets, Browning, Tennyson, blah, 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 reading in their own voices. And this time I got Shakespeare socks and a little tiny skull you could hold in your hand. And when you flick it on, its eyes flash up and it does the, the be or not the be speech. <laughs> so, you know, the British Library has got the hell off. <laughs> so, I shall begin. This, uh, two new poems. An old poem that I have to read for Brian. Uh, and uh, this is called Seven Times Seven is Twenty One. <laughs> when I was four, I fretted over things I couldn't do, like tie my tie, tie my shoe. Ah, laces were beyond me. As were such things as seven times seven is. No, it's not again. My dad would get it right every time. I'd uh, oh, forget. It. Or he would tie my laces so they couldn't come undone. Or do me a splendid wins or not. For the life of me, I simply could not. And when I grew up to be five, would I know by then? Surely by ten, Brian. I was never sure about being sure. Ties, laces, times, tables, defeating me. My father, all love and hugs and smiles. Now them, them I could do. And my father could pin a river down. A blue line flowing in an atlas. Watching it wriggle under his tongue. Vlatava, he'd command it, and I would pause to listen to its name. He told me the river lived in Prague, and that was somewhere... Ah, oh, I forget it. And here I am, at almost 64, gazing at the Vlatava in person. Know it for what it is, and all its swans, all its swans. I even know where Prague is now. I stand in its December. My father, who art in heaven, I pray to you as I would do when I was two. You better than any god I could ever imagine. So here I be in Praha, watching the waters of the Vlatava, repeating a Czech tongue twister, laughing at its absence of vowels. Prid krit skriz drin, se prid shlit drist zir. What a hammer. Mm -hmm. Still have trouble with the, those damned laces. My wife laughs as they come and done and come and done. Damn them. Damn them, can only make a bad stab at a Windsor knot, get by by not wearing a tie. Mm -hmm. Hugs and loves and smiles, oh, I know they're my heart. I hug you in my mind's eye, know that seven times seven is and always will be. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But, Brian, what does the check mean? Why do you want to know what the check <laughs> Oh, God, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that, Brian. Prit krit skriz drin, se prit schlit herst zern, means a mole farted through grass having swallowed a handful of grain. Oh, yeah. Right. 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 Uh, the version I like is Lana Turner and Fernando Lamas uh, being beautiful and Argentina and everything like that. And um, so all men should love you, not wisely, but well. And uh, I still love the Merry Widow. The Merry Widow, you know, pops up. The Velia song pops up uh, everywhere. Uh, the Merry Widow walks itself. Oh, I try love to, then I love, I love you. And uh, you'll get that in Sam Beckett. That's what when uh, she's playing in her little music box and she's buried up to here. Uh, you get it in, uh, is it Lossie's film of the Dead in Venice? And then they have the little boy and he's looking longingly at this little boy and the orchestra in the background is going, Though I try love to, then I love, I love you. And that, so it comes up anyway. Uh, this is how I got to it. Uh, it was essence of childhood for me. And I used to look after this lovely woman called Madeline, and she would say, like a stuck record, um, uh, I'll soon be in my grave. <laughs> and we go, no, Madeline, no. <laughs> like I was when I was 10. But I don't think I'll get out again. 
It could be untying her boots for her. It could be bathing her. It could be doing her hair and she'll go. And it'll be the grave thing again. I think I'll be in my grave. Where is this coming from? And I only found out inadvertently. I was taking her boots off and she used to wear those check the ripper boots. There's lots of eyes and things. I was taking them off. And I inadvertently started singing just to myself, like, you know, and she said, how does a young fella like you know, like that, know that? And it woke her out of everything. And the music brought her back, and she told me the story of how, about the grave. She took a shortcut one time. So, not wisely, but well. I was 10 then, had been in the grave for only an hour, but it seemed forever. Hadn't expected an empty grave. Hadn't expected to fall in. I was just a little slip of a girl, not looking where I was going. My head all scales and arpeggios. I was scared because I was late for my singing lesson. What would Madame say? A grave, you say? You fell into a grave? The sky gazed down at me, so blue against this box of earth. A crow perched on the lip, wondering how I got into this. Help! I wailed. And again, help! All to no avail. I grew a little pale. I'm not dead, really. Really, I'm not. The world refused to listen. Only the rain talked to me in big, fat, dollopy drops. I sang Vilia from The Merry Widow as if my heart would break. Vilia, oh Vilia, your heart is aflame. To keep warm, keep the fear away. Soft as a kiss, hear me whisper your name. The grave sang. The grave digger approached in trepidation, crossing himself <laughs> at each step, calling on God to give him strength, not sure if I was angel or devil. He sang back to test me. Feel ya, oh feel ya, my heart calls to you. Very shaky and I must say slightly off key. And I piped up from six feet below. Where is the love song we knew? I sang with all my might as if my life depended on it. He got me out, falling in himself. I climbed onto his shoulders, then onto his head, and scrambled back into the world. My white frock, quite, quite filthy. Oh, what would Madame and Mama say? It was my first public performance, and after that, I could sing anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> He's got this lovely, slow, sardonic drawl, and when he talks, he's like a gunfighter. He goes, Hitty, <laughs> well, come, you'd never read me that poem about death and there are no anymore. And when he says that his words are like, you know, a gunslinger throwing the coat back like that, the fingers itching over. And I know he's smarter than me and sharper than me, so I think, all right, I'll read you the bloody poem, right? So I hadn't expected to read this poem, so now I'm reading it, all right, Brian? <laughs> He's such a hard taskmaster. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the misfortune to have a heart attack, and I had the great fortune to, to survive the heart attack. You know, that of a ghost talking to you, haunting you. And a heart attack is extremely, it's the pain that passes all understanding. And I was talking to my girlfriend, and we were saying, will we go and cycle down by the Rail Canal today? And the last thing I said was, uh, I went to say Philomena. And I got as far as Philo, and the world went away. And this thing tightened across my chest. And it was incredibly painful. Then it tightened again, and it couldn't get more pain. It did get more painful, and it tightened and tightened, and I was just about to be extinguished, and then it goes into bliss. Lady Death comes into the room, kisses you on the lips, and you say, am I going now? And she says, no, not yet, Beth. And I go, don't, don't leave me, no. And I want to go with her. But um, I survived, as I said. So, your littlest smile. <laughs> Death, rather dividend rather shy, comes to me and says, it's time to die. Oh, okay, I say, when? Now? <laughs> like this moment? What, this second? Ah, uh, I struggle with my heart attack as death, feeling bad about it, uh, repossesses my artifacts. Outside, a van pulls up with neat gothic script, death removals, it spells out in big, bold letters. I like it. Death's got style and a nice smile, and is a kind of groovy guy. Or is he a lady? Oh boy, it's hard to tell. This heart attack hurts like hell. Okay, boys, 
take it all away. That's little helpers, all big bruisers, all over six foot two, former nightclub bouncers. They take away the blue sky on the which I first kissed you. They take away the little day-to-day -day things I always loved. The shape of your mouth, your continuously falling hair, brushed impatiently away from your eyes, your eyes. The smell of your perfume in an empty room. The littlest of your smiles I had saved for a rainy day. Meanwhile, like a living Houdini, I had done it. Somehow wrestled out of death's heart jacket. Damn, death spat in a peevish manner. How in God's name did you do that? Death sighed. Okay, kid, you got me this time. Right, boys, put it all back, put everything back. Liz boy scowled at me as if to say, I will remember you, sonny Jim. You, death snarled from the side of his mouth. And I now, no more Mr. Nice Guy. You, I'll see you again. A tear trickled down my cheek, unable to speak. All I could do was glance down, your littlest smile clasped tightly in my hands. Uh, this is, sorry, Chad. This is called The Smell of Purple. We published this back in 2014 at the New Delhi International Poetry Festival and in this year of Perfect Vision 2020 we're reincarnating it. So this is the title poem, it's just about growing up with my little girl and her teaching Daddy the World as it goes according to her. So the smell of purple, she came in one day and she said, uh, God I forgot my own poem now. <laughs> she says she can smell yellow. She says she can smell blue, despite not being able to spell either colour. Yellow, don't you know this? Yellow smells like blue, like a wet kitty dropping by the fire. Red smells like mammy when she kisses, but kisses smell different when she kisses you. Then she smells like flames or little orange ticks. Favourite, favourite smell, favourite smell. Uh, favorite smell. Purple is my favourite smell. It smells just like a magic spell. I kiss her goodnight like lilac, only lighter, with little flecks of purple scattered here and there. Thank you. Nice. I've been in a hot little life in the world, just me, but I'm crying, staring at me like, always I'm nervous. This is called Mr. Daddy's Soft Soft. Always her fascination with me shaving. This, her early morning ritual, observing each action as if it were holy. I hide my face in foam. Santa Claus, Santa Claus, she chants, winces with delight as the razor, she gulps, goes over my bump, <gasps> gasp without slicing it off. The shaven uncovers the me she knows. Soft, soft, Mr. Daddy, soft, soft, she gurgles in a lather of laughter. Me now, me now, me now, she pleads like a tiny police car. I take the brush, coat her reflection with foam. I shave her with the tip of my little finger. Her reflection sniggers and she sniggers too. Later in the early evening she appears bearded and fresh cream. She shaves herself with a lollipop stick. Me daddy now, see? I cha-cha-cha her on the tips of my toes as she clings to my fingertips. The living room dances around us, one delighted half-shaved little girl, one delighted soft salt, Mr. Daddy. <laughs> New book, only call, uh, out this, this minute, it's called Crawling Out and Falling Up. And that is Tilly again. So, it's called Crawling Out and Falling Up. Her first puddle. There's rain, lying dead in a hole. She's only ever seen rain fall, not trapped in a pothole. Why doesn't it crawl out and fall up? <coughs> indeed. I see it happen in thought, not indeed. I have to admit, I've never thought of it quite like that. <laughs> now she's grown up and doesn't even remember it. We meet a modern day puddle and she's puzzled when I say, why doesn't it crawl out and fall up? Oh, da, she sighs. How do you ever think of such things? <laughs> um, father, then, could happen. 
Oh, uh, I was doing this, I, I work in care a lot, and I see a lot of people die uh, for a lot of deaths in my own personal life. And the last time Jan was in the book, she threw out half the book because she said they're all about death again. So I thought I'd better write on them poems instead. So this is called Toast. So I'm not writing about death and stuff like that. I write poems like Toast. Fire! Fire! The house was busily burning down. Quick, quick, Mum screeched. Go fetch the marshmallows. I dashed back into the inferno and emerged long minutes later, my eyebrows ablaze, my nostril hairs slightly singed. The fire had greedily gobbled up all the marshmallows for itself. Damn, said Mum. Damn, damn, damn. Slapping me about the head with each uttered syllable. I managed to save a loaf of mother's pride, I cried. It'll have to do, sighed Mum. And so we had toast. It's <laughs> called doing fine. I told you that I love you. I told you what I was going to do when I got you all to myself alone, didn't my chat? I told you there was sudden laughter on the line. I think you got the wrong number now, but keep talking, you're doing fine. <laughs> One has to be, one has to be careful. <laughs> right, uh, this is just a title list, haiku. And it's got lots of sound effects. Um, what? What? Said the dog. Yeah, yeah, said the cat. Oh, fuck off, said the parrot. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, this is called uh, Dalek. I thought being a Dalek was a job for life. He was a Dalek, fallen on hard times. Got a job on the underground, announcing stations, announcing stations, announcing stations. His wife also had seen better days. Got a job as a talking clock. Mr. and Mrs. Dalek, far now from extermination of others and world domination. The next station will be Waterloo, Waterloo. At the final stroke, it'll be 12 o'clock. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Uh, and finally, this is a haiku that has a title. It's called Old Dog, New Tricks. Is my little girl, Kelly. Uh, third year of being herself, and she uh, had 40 of her little peers over the proof this fact, and they were all going bananas. And they, they had red jelly, yellow jelly, blue jelly, and they'd run out of yellow jelly. And there's all other jelly, but they wanted the yellow jelly. So I went out to get the yellow jelly. So I'm coming back to the jellies like this. And they're going absolutely bananas. And I'm like, what can 43 little three year olds do to make that amount of noise? And I'm approaching the door, and I've got to. Uh, open the door with my, my knee, but before I can do that, it's, it's, it just cuts all the noise, and it's just total silence, and now I'm afraid of the silence. I'm so afraid I'm going to drop my jellies, for God's sake. And uh, before I can do anything, the door bangs over, 43 little children stampede all over me, and they basically say this talk. Old dog, new tricks. <laughs> the dog's in the loo, we were teaching him to pee. Uh, and you just fell in. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> I think you better.